Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of How Did We Not Know That? I'm Nat. I'm Jack. And we have a very special guest, Becky, from The Yay. Happy Project. And yeah, she's here to talk to us about some very important topics. So, Becky, do you want to really like briefly talk about your podcast, what you guys discuss, and why you guys started it? Sure. Yeah. Well, first off, it's so nice to be here, and it's really exciting to be on your guys' episode here. Um, so, yeah, I am the creator of The Happy Project, which originally was a YouTube channel. And then we expanded to the podcast to get a bit more extensive on topics, you know, those deep dives and conversations. And uh, we talked primarily, originally primarily was to be about the mixed Korean experience in all its forms. And that could mean, you know, third culture kids or uh, ethnically Korean groups that are living outside of Korea and the culture has developed in a different way according to their surroundings, like Koryo Saram, for example, in post-Soviet Union states. And uh, we realized that a lot of mixed Koreans or outside of Korea, Korean communities miss a certain aspect of Korean culture because that historical context is also lacking. So we decided to do more deep dives about specific topics or historically significant events. That way, you know, you can get that context to better understand yourself and where you came from. So the podcast has developed to be beyond just the mixed Korean experience, but also talking about history and culture. And uh, yeah, it's been going pretty well. And it's pretty fun. I learned a lot of things like what I did for this episode. I did a lot of research and it was a lot of fun for me to kind of go back into time for this one. Yay. Yes, please check out The Happy Project. We love it. As you guys know, Nat and I briefly talk about it. We don't talk about that much, but we also come from mixed backgrounds. So Mm -hmm. it was so cool to meet Becky and realize that there's a whole another community and there's so many more people who are mixed that we don't like usually get to hear about in media. So Mm -hmm. please check it out. Yeah, well, I I love that you guys found us. I really appreciate that. Of course, of course. So, Becky, what will you be talking about today? Well, I wanted to find something that hopefully I can come from a somewhat, like, (laughs) I don't want to say expert, but at least a little bit of, you know, foundation I'm standing on here to talk about, but which also would be interesting to your audience. And so... I thought we could do just a brief history of K-pop going from the Korean War, maybe even before that, up to the modern day. And there's just, um, it's a lot more than just music development, you know? So it's going to be very interesting and it was... It was really fun to look at these old music videos and to be learning the backstories and those kind of things. So that's just a little teaser, a little teaser for you guys right now. (laughs) Can I just say, I didn't, when you were talking about doing this uh, topic, I for some reason did not realize k-pop has definitely not been around for forever Mm. i always thought k-pop was just the music industry like in the states we've always had music it's never really been like okay now the music industry is starting Mm -hmm. so i was like oh yeah there definitely wasn't k-pop like way back in like the (laughs) 1800s you know yeah it's really fresh i mean it hasn't been around so long but you can trace the threats all the way back through time, through history, to specific events, specific moments and time periods. And you can watch how that influence sort of the momentum builds up and then it ends up becoming this K-pop industry that we know today. But it's fascinating to see how it's it's all tied together. But I mean, it's similar in the U.S. as well. When you look at modern hip hop, for example, how it trails back and back and back to very significant moments. So you can see there's some parallels that are happening, but we'll get into that. Okay, well, first off, I would like to just uh, give a heads up if we have any some serious K-pop fans who are listening to this episode. I am by no means a K-pop fan nor expert, so I came from a very third-person point of view here. Um, But uh, I did kind of reignite a little bit of love for those first-gen K-pop stars as I was looking at this. But anyway, I thought first we could try to define K-pop. I think this is really important. The word K-pop, obviously, is just Korean popular music, right? Originated in South Korea. But we use the word pop, while in the U.S. it might have a defined sound. When we talk about K-pop, it's not really, it's not really like pop, 
per se. K-pop is influenced by all kinds of genres. You've got pop and rock, jazz, gospel, hip hop, of course, R&B, folk, classical. All of these genres kind of melt together to create this K-pop sound. So we just use pop in the term popular music, as in it's mainstream and popular today. And um, it's very unique because it's not just about the sound. The thing that really separates K-pop from other styles of music are the visuals, as you guys probably know, right? You've seen probably the music videos. Oh yeah, favorites? BTS, yeah. Butter, that is a bop. <laughs> I'm so into Butter right now. <laughs> just like, yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, the sorry, go ahead too. Now. No, yeah. I was just gonna say like, specifically like choreography is really what stands out to me. Like compared to American music videos, I feel like, mm-hmm. yeah, the choreography is next level and it's incredible. That's really Thank true. You. That's actually a significant part. It's the chore- choreography that uh, not only is it interesting visually, but it also hooks the fans because, I mean, think about it. Do you guys know um, One Million Dance Studio? Have you heard of them? Yes. I used to watch their videos in college all the time. I would like procrastinate just watching their dance like covers. Yeah. This is like, I would say thanks to One Million Dance Studio, K-pop choreography has really started to become even more popular globally. It started by uh, Leah Kim, right? She actually, I met her at Seoul Fashion Week. It was like a couple years back and she had just started One Million Dance Studio and it was so interesting, but it takes these kind of interactions with the fans globally and the K-pop choreography especially is so, I think, hooking and interesting for people to try to learn, which is just further pushing the music itself. So choreography, visuals, and music is all tied together. That's what makes K-pop so unique and also, I mean, it's really powerful. It's not just a like a sound. <laughs> it's visually really up there in your face. Um, let's see. Beyond that, K-pop is also, it's a cultural product of values, right? This is, I think this is why K-pop is also very powerful because it's it's not just the trendy music of the time. Now K-pop has really evolved to be exporting about Korea, to have Korean culture and identity and values put in the music. And I think BTS has done a really good job with that, being a sort of cultural ambassador. Do you, so how, how long ago did you guys actually hear about K-pop? Have you always been fans? Yeah, so I, I had another question I want to ask you, but we can save it. Um, yeah. Actually, I should ask it now before I, before I forget, but it's just a side question that I was curious about. But, like, what do you think about K-pop people that aren't Korean? Because it's starting mm-hmm. to get so mainstream that there are people who are, like, not Korean but mm-hmm. will still, like, try to become K-pop stars. How do we feel about that? Since it's the Korean culture is such yeah. a big part of it. That's a really excellent question. So K-pop starting, I would say... Even in the early 2000s, we did have non-Korean members appearing in certain groups, but primarily the industries in which we wanted to break into. So you'll see there are some groups that had Japanese K-pop artists or Thai or Chinese especially um, or mixed artists. But the thing that's notable is because image is so strong and there's still this concept of like homogenous all Korea. Even those non-Korean K-pop idols are sort of transformed or using makeup or style to appear Korean enough to kind of fly under the radar. So of course, there have been non-Korean idols, but I think the question now is, is it going to reach the point where we have non-Asian or non-Korean passing idols uh, starting to appear? That's honestly, I, I really can't say. I It's hard because I'm at this conflict where it's like, but this is Korean music. This is K-pop. This is very Korean, strongly that. But at the same time, then you ask, but what's Korean? And now the Korean identity and image is starting to change. You're going to have kids that are, let's say, half black and half Korean who are now appearing. And they're also Korean. So does the K-pop idol media play a part in shaping what this image of quote unquote Korean star looks like? Probably. I just don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah, because I remember I was watching one of your guys' videos and you guys mentioned this person. I had to look him up, but I guess he was half, um, he was half Nigerian, half Korean. Mm, and I think he's really, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, wow, because he's Korean, right? But I was like, he must have grown up really getting treated as if he wasn't. I'm sure if he came to the States, no one would even, mm-hmm. like, pick up that he was Korean until you hear, like, he can't speak English. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, wow, there's such a diversity of, like, what it means to be part of a group. And then how yeah. do you take that and have it represent, like, K-pop in such a, you know, complex, not complex, but diverse industry, potentially. Um Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and now because K-pop is, like, such a huge international phenomenon, like, you have people mm-hmm. from all over the world listening to it. So then you get into this complicated territory, like, also, who is defining, who gets to define what mm-hmm. is Korean, you know? So, like, I wonder if certain audiences perceive, like, oh, you know what? This is okay. Like, yes, this is acceptable K-pop, but then other audiences are maybe struggling a bit with that, so... Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a little difficult with K-pop for sure. I mean, because coming from such a homogenous nation and there's already a distinct look when people think Korean, oh, this is what Korean looks like. So would K-pop be represented, let's say, by an all English white boy band who appears and says that they're K-pop because of the sound? But K-pop is not just sound. You know, K-pop is also visuals and it's the culture and the heritage of the music. So I'm sure it will transform and change as there is a global audience as well but i think it it has to come from the inside out and as the society becomes more heterogeneous eventually i i I do believe it's going to happen eventually but as always with these things it just takes just takes time yeah but that's a really good question Thank you. Yeah, I was holding it in. I was like, I don't know if it's too risque <laughs> to bring it out. No, yeah, but great. I was thinking about it all week. But yeah, to go back to your question, though. So for me, my mom is, I'm half Chinese, half Italian, and my mm. mom is from Malaysia. So I, and I grew up in like rural Ohio, so I never heard about basically anything Asian. I didn't mm. even realize my family spoke Cantonese till I was like 16. But when I was 16, I went back to Malaysia and K-pop is popular in Malaysia. So mm-hmm. my cousins, who were older than me, showed me uh, Rooftop Prince. Have you heard of it? Yeah, it's like a, <laughs> It's like a K-drama. So yeah. that's what got me um, exposed to K-drama. And then I remember, mm-hmm. like, G-Dragon's Crayon song yeah, yeah, was really yeah. popular. And that was, like, the first K-pop song I heard. Um, so I don't know if I was into K-pop at that moment, but I was into K-dramas for sure mm-hmm. after that summer. So that's when I got more exposed to Korean pop culture, at least. Mm-mm. I would say that K-dramas became more popular overseas before K-pop. But eventually they do go hand in hand. But that that's kind of what I would, I would think initially. Yeah, because K-dramas have been around for a while, you know, um, before K-pop was starting to become mainstream in other countries. But I, yeah, Malaysia... Maybe some Chinese-speaking countries and Japan, of course. K-pop broken before it hit the Western world. Nat, what about you, though? Because actually, Nat exposed me to more K-pop music. Because she made me a whole playlist. Because I was like, I need more Chinese music, more Korean music. And then Nat made me a whole playlist. So Yeah, when we were in China together, we we were roommates. And so we had like our morning playlist. And it was such a mix of, yeah, Chinese, Korean, so many different songs. And you were showing me like French songs too I think but oh yeah um, I had French on my (laughs) place but it was really exciting um so I first like I first heard like found out about k-pop in high school one of my friends in my math class she had seen like those YouTube videos I forgot the name of the channel but it's like teens react kids react one of like those really big reaction channels and they were reacting to exo uh call me baby and like she watched it and she like (laughs) showed it to me and we were like what is this like this is amazing and so it was her my sister and I like we all were like we got into exo like really big Mm because we were like this is like so different than anything we've listened to and again it was like the visuals were like it was just so, uh, like, enticing. We were like, we need to watch more and more. Mm-hmm. Um, so in high school, I really listened to K-pop a lot. After high school, I, like, kind of went out of the phase a little bit. Um, but now that I'm living in Korea again, um, well, not again, now that I'm living in Korea, uh, I just am exposed to it a lot more often. And I'm like, oh, you know what? So I'm kind of slowly getting back into that K-pop phase. But, yeah. 
Did you, what kind of songs or artists did you guys like listening to? We, it was mostly EXO. It was BTS when they like first debuted, you know, like before Dynamite and everything. But um, I am trying to think. It was mostly boy bands, actually. Mm-hmm. We didn't listen to that many girl band, girl groups. And we really did like some of the, like, I guess now they're the older groups, like Big Bang, Shiny, mm-hmm. <laughs> Super Junior. But yeah, yeah that's those amazing. guys are legit. Yeah. <laughs> I really liked Eile. Does any is she still Eilid, around? Yeah. I really liked her song Heaven because mm-hmm. my cousin played it at like karaoke and I was like, oh, this is like the best song ever. It was like the only song I knew for a long time. Eilid's but awesome. <laughs> she's great. She's, she's amazing. She's Korean American, you know. That I heard. I heard she's from Jersey or something. I was like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, how about we step back into way back in time? Is that okay with you guys? Of course. Zip zip backwards. So pretty much um, the introduction of Western music, because we know that K-pop was heavily influenced by Western music, right? And uh, 1885, the American missionary, Henry Appenzeller. Have you guys ever heard of him? He pops up in history, Korean history every once in a while. But Henry Appenzeller, he, I think he was a British, oh no, American missionary, but he was teaching basically uh local koreans western songs so he would sing these western songs and they became popularized and people would change them into korean lyrics so actually an original popular one was uh, oh my darling clementine and you can sometimes if you look it up online like korean oh my darling clementine it became a very like um kind of emotional piece as opposed to the cute little ditty that we know today so these come importance later it sounds a little bit random but these are basically called changka, and changka were Korean lyrics to popular Western songs. So <laughs> there's that. So the changka became very important during the Japanese rule. We know about the Japanese oppression that happened 1910 through 1945, and these changkas were used as a, a way to fight against the Japanese oppression through music. The music was really significant and a really uh, I guess a really powerful one was called uh, Himanga, but it was based off the hymn, The Lord Into His Garden Comes, like that old English hymn. Um, and why these were powerful is because they had these, they would put these like Korean lyrics that were fighting against Korean op- Japanese oppression and the Japanese rule would confiscate these songs or they would say, you can't play this, they would ban them. And so of course, as we know, when somebody says, you can't do that, suddenly you really want to do it, <laughs> right? But the Korean people would use this music to fight back against oppression. So music already at that time had more than just for listening purposes, you know, more than just for fun. They have this meaning. And you can look up the lyrics. Some of them are just like himanga. I, I guess, what, what would you call that in um, English? I guess it's like my hope or like my hope song. Um, I do recommend you guys check it out because it's just such a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, I can send it to you guys a little bit later. Yeah, for sure. Like. We can link it below. Yes, for our yeah. Listeners. I really highly recommend for people to hear this. But already you're watching like this Western influence in music happening and Korean people are taking it. They're adding their own lyrics, they're adding their own sound and their own soul into those songs. And this is a trend that we will see through time. But um, yeah, that is kind of the, the first thought that I had. So time moves on. The first Korean pop album was in 1925. And even though it was a Korean pop album, technically, it was actually a Japanese song that they translated into Korean lyrics. But maybe the very, very, very first pop song that was actually Korean, this was in 1929. And then uh, trot music came out in 19, also 1920s. Do you know trot music? You guys know trot? Trap trot? music. It's trot or trap? Trap is in like Oh, not US trap, trap, not trap. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, huh? <laughs> it's <laughs> called trot. Like, uh, I, guess, like, I guess in English, T-R-O-T. Ah, uh, okay. Have you heard yeah. of it? Oh. Like, like dance, I've heard of, like, like, ballroom dancing, like, the trot. Like, that music. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you guys are cute. Um, <laughs> it's like, uh, how do I explain it? It's like in Korean, like, da 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 dan 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 You know, like, they have this, like, very old style Korean pop and, like, all that. Ajumas and Ajishis love to dance to this music. Ah, uh, <laughs> okay, okay. I you think know I know the vibe. Yeah, I you think know, I you, you'll hear it. Like once you hear it, you'll know. Everyone knows trot music. 
Trout is like, huh? I don't know how what the parallel would be in the States. I guess it's like doo-wop. You know, in the States they had doo-wop and it was like, it's like that oldie kind of cutesy something. Yeah. Like, generation. like Tsuro is like that, but it's more, it's more poppy, I guess. But it was pretty much like, it was a Japanese composer. He took Korean folksy music and he mixed it with gospel music and then layers on a little bit of this electronics and stuff. So Trot was pretty hot for a long time since the 20s up until maybe I guess like the 60s. It was the, it was the music. So now we have the Korean Peninsula, 1945 liberation from Japanese occupation. And this is where things really start to heat up because the American troops came to the South Korean Peninsula. And this is where the Western style bars and clubs were coming in and playing the Western music. And um, this is where the spread of American and Western culture was really happening in Korea. Have you guys visited around like Yongsan base or any of the military bases in Korea? By any is chance? that like DMZ? By any oh, chance? DMZ, it is a military occupation place, but it's not really where popular culture <laughs> was growing. <laughs> more, like, more like Yongsan. Yongsan in Itaewon area. Or um, there's certain pockets, right, where there's a lot of uh, soldiers. Maybe, maybe, um, Nat, maybe you visited a place. Um, I know Itaewon. where, I, right now I'm living in Gyeonggi, though, mm-hmm. Gyeonggi province, and there are quite a few, like, military bases near me. I haven't gotten super close, but, yeah. Mm-hmm. There are some specific military bases in Korea. This is where the American army was based. So there's Korean b- bases only, and then there's also ones with American in I would say the most primary ones would be Osan, Pyeongtaek, and Humphreys, and then Yongsan. And Yongsan was really the spot where Western music was happening because it was actually a way for Korean people to make money, to make a living, because people were very impoverished at that time in Korea. But these Western-style bars and clubs were popping up. American soldiers were spending money. And so Korean people who wanted to make a living, who would get close enough, would learn how to sing you know, these 40s tunes, these 50 tunes that were really, really popular at the time. And uh, then we had people like Nat King Cole, Marilyn Monroe, Louis Armstrong. They came and visited Korea to perform for the American troops. You should look up these photos of Marilyn Monroe. It's just, I don't know what it is about her in that time period, but it's so, it's so breathtaking. But um, yeah, check those out. It's really gorgeous. But of course, got a lot of attention from the Korean public. I was reading Korean blogs about Marilyn Monroe visiting and I was like, do they have, you know, do they have any first-hand accounts of Korean people at the time, what they thought of her? And there was one where it was a kid who had seen her at the time and he was telling like the news reporter, oh yeah, she had such a big bum. I never saw such a big bum in my life, <laughs> which was so cute. That's so but cute. It got loads of attention, right? Of course, I mean, these are like American stars that were coming. And so their music was interesting. It was different. And they got media attention. And then the American Forces Korea Network Radio in 1957, they started broadcasting music that was popular in the States. So we're starting to see some more influence happening in Korean, Korean music. And so popular songs started to be modeled after American songs. There were open auditions. Musicians started to perform in the U.S. Army clubs. Speaking of this one guy, um, he's called the godfather of Korean rock. We actually, well, I got in touch with him before COVID happened. We wanted to interview him because he was one of the first to develop rock music in Korea. And he learned that by performing at these clubs on the bass. So it's so interesting to see how they're, you know, entwined together. Yeah, I didn't realize that there were, like, American artists were traveling at that time. I don't know why I thought everyone was in the dark ages back then. (laughs) That's incredible that like Marilyn Monroe and Louis Armstrong were like Mm. in Korea performing and everything. This is the era where everything becomes like it starts to become more clear what it is. Uh, K-pop. But okay, here we are. 1957. Then 1959. This is the Kim sisters. The Kim sisters were a trio of three Korean women. And I don't think they were actually sisters. Um, But anyway, they learned how to sing these Western songs because the soldiers, of course, they pay to see their performances. And so they would do good music. They would get money. And this was actually to support their family. A lot of the artists at that time who were learning Western songs were doing this out of necessity. 
So that's it's very interesting to see that. But they were the first to go to Las Vegas and do a performance. They started getting U.S. media attention. They were the first Korean artists to release an album in the U.S. pop market. Their song Charlie Brown, it reached number seven on the Billboard single charts. They were on TV oh programs, gosh. held tours. Nobody knows this, right? Like nobody talks about the yeah. Twin Sisters. Yeah. Yeah. I want to listen they to were the, the song now. <laughs> Wait, they're so <laughs> cute. Charlie Seriously. Brown. Yeah. Um. Do but are they popular in Korea? Like everyone knows the Kim sisters, or is it also people don't really know in Korea about them? Oh yeah, no people. They're kind of legends here. Okay. And okay. One of them, I think one of them is still alive. She's like this old grandma now, but she still, you know, <laughs> pops up every once in a while. From last I checked, which was actually a couple of years ago, I don't know what she's doing now. But yeah, they're. I mean, they're kind of legendary to think about. They were the first to break into the U.S. market. Yeah, and, international uh, superstars. I know, it's so cool. They're so cute. You have to see them. Seriously, okay. they're, they're very, I guess, um, energetic. <laughs> I mean, that's the best word to say it. But, I mean, think about it. 1959, like, the Korean War had just ended. Technically, didn't even end. Um, Korea was really struggling to get through these tar- tough times, very impoverished at that moment. And international travel between Korea and the U.S. was not open at all it was quite restricted so this is a very very unique case but that's the first time that we had a korean artist kind of breaking into the u.s at that point now 1963 what happens in 1963 beatlemania in the u.s and so everybody was crazy about the beatles and we can see these waves of uh, influence from western music industry coming to korea primarily through the american soldiers who are based here and the radio so Beatlemania also came to Korea, and this is where rock bands started to appear. This is where the group sound becomes popular, because primarily you'll see with like trot singers or balladeers, it's mostly like that single individual, and then they have their backup people. But group sound was starting to appear, and we definitely know K-pop is all about that group sound. So this is kind of like, you know, the Beatles have that group sound. They've got that great like, they just have it, that group <laughs> sound, right? <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. Are you guys Beatle fans? Yeah. yeah. I am. Yeah. My <laughs> aunt was. I'm not. I don't know. Legit? Do you don't like the I Beatles? Like, no, like, who doesn't like the Beatles? But, like, if you ask me, like, name three songs, I'd be like, um, Yellow Submarine. Like, oh, my Lord. <laughs> oh, no. I'm hurt. I'm actually physically hurt. Well, Sorry, guys. I'll listen to them right after this. Kim okay. Sisters and the Beatles. Just like, <laughs> yeah, right. one, two, all day. That's a perfect combination. <laughs> Yeah, so the group sound. Group sound is becoming popular. And this is, uh, you know, that rock artist that I mentioned earlier, Shin Jung Hyun. He produces the first rock song. He's so interesting, too. Like, he has this long white hair and he's got these glasses. He looks like a rock star, grandfather. Uh, He's still around. We're trying to get him after COVID. Anyway, he releases the first rock song, Korean rock song, 1964. So this is happening in the 60s. Many students are being influenced by American culture, lifestyle. They're starting to make more lighthearted music, as we can see with the rock music. Because prior to that, you know, it's kind of serious stuff uh, because Korea just went through so many hard times. But folk music was really influencing these younger generations and the music that they were making. And then modern music festivals. These guys start to appear because the TV stations like NBC, they organize music contests for the students. This was in the 70s. Now, in Korean history, if you know, uh, after the war, technically it was a democracy. But uh, in the 60s and late 70s especially, we had more of a regime than a democracy, kind of a dictatorship. So we see, especially in the U.S., think about uh, Vietnam. What was a really opposing force to Vietnam? What was the way that people would, I guess, show their dissent was through music. And um, the same thing happened in Korea, of course, which is what I love this about music. I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm also a musician at heart. So this is very, you know, like special to think about music. Do you guys do you guys play any instruments or sing or anything? Yeah, I used to play piano for like 10 nice. years, nice. but I haven't done it in a while. What okay. about you practice. Yeah, I know. I need to get back at it. <laughs> 
Yeah, I am definitely not a musician. I played the trombone in middle school, and then wow. <laughs> I haven't really picked up an instrument since then. <laughs> but but now has a nice singing voice. I remember sing we would you. sing together in the morning. She has a beautiful voice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> of course. Also, I was gonna say it reminds me. I don't remember the term, but Nat, do you remember in the United States, like that was the main way that. Um, the slaves would rise up as well as through music and there was what was it called it's like i want to keep saying it's like bluegrass but it's not bluegrass it was like not soul bluegrass. music not soul music i know I what you're what talking about but is. oh yeah. spirituals are you talking about spirituals is it spiritual like is that what the down word was? moses you know those kind yeah, of songs. yeah yeah exactly mm-hmm. spirituals ah okay yeah but it reminds what well, you were talking about it. i was like that's exactly like how we learned about it in the states is like kind of like to not make peace with it or whatever but like to protest as best as you could you could do it through Mm. song yeah it's very gorgeous to think about this because music is such it's not an individual thing you know those around you who hear it they feel that as well it's very resonating and so it's such a such a universal language as well so I think music is is so powerful and it's no doubt that's why we see these waves of Hallyu wave Korean music it passes certain lines even though the language is primarily in Korean even though the artists are primarily from Korea still they have this universal appeal because music is far greater than just the actual systemic makeup of a song well where were we we were in the the 70s right oh yeah the dictatorship it's technically, I mean, quote unquote democracy, but we, everyone refers it to like a dictatorship because that's practically what it was like. It was like a military takeover. This was uh, President Park chung hee especially, and his government. So there was lots of activism. Remember I mentioned the students who were using music and the music festivals were happening and the students were getting very active in this. Well, it wasn't just the music activism, but it was actually political activism as well, fighting against the regime. And the way they did that was music. And so if you look up songs from that time period, a lot of them can be very patriotic. A lot of them can be very heartfelt. Um, And today, still, they're very special songs, you know, these very patriotic moments. So the students would demonstrate against the regime. And there's just so much interesting stuff that came out of this. I kind of view it like, you know, when you push something down so tight like this, something has to squirt out that way. And it just comes out maybe forcefully or what you didn't expect it's a little bit like that i think because the regime was pushing down folk music was banned by the government he was banning american pop music he was banning korean rock music because you know rock music is so crazy and he was banning trot because this was influenced by the japanese so all of this music was getting banned so things that were coming out were some really interesting daring experimental music and one that i recommend you listen to is uh by han <laughs> his his song is called muljom chuso and i'll send you this link as well but uh, he was banned from performing in korea because he was so shocking with his singing style and his voice but his his lyrics if you read them are really just like i'm thirsty give me water if you listen to the song it's it's wild it's really really wild but he is saying like i'm thirsty are you gonna just pass by and not give me water and so in a way it's expressing his his pain and his struggle which is representative of that time you know what was happening actually in the country and society but that song was totally iconic and still to today people remember this as wow this was like one of those those uh, turning points in korean musical history so this, during this time, there are very many notable and unique singers who are popping up, breaking a little bit out of what we expect from the traditional Korean music style. And uh, now we're going to hit the 80s, and this is the era of ballads. I'm sure you guys know some Korean ballads by any chance. I don't know any by name, but just I hear Korean ballads all the time, just like walking down the streets, <laughs> or like, especially in restaurants, and whenever I go to karaoke with my Korean friends it's always just ballads the whole time which we I always talk about with my Korean friends like I don't know like when I go with my like American or Mm. like other western friends we're always singing like like you know like Mm. 
nostalgic songs like Britney Spears, Madonna, like just throwback pop songs. And then all my Korean friends are just slow, like emotional, like really like heartful ballads. So yeah, it's really interesting. Yes. I love to see how music is, it's generated or, or created out of this universal emotion that exists in that time of history in that certain country, right? You can think about, again, I'm trying to find parallels in U.S. musical history to kind of express the differences and also similarities. Like we have the punk rock movements happening in the U.S. This maybe this anger or this teenage angst to break out of what normal society is demanding of you. This is kind of, you know, happening in the U.S. or I really think most notably uh, hip hop in the U.S. decrying the, the difficulties that are happening or asking for social justice. This is very significant when you can see that happening in the U.S. Similarly to that in Korea, these kind of ballads are coming out of this this well of sadness that exists in the Korean people and the Korean history. Because if you look at some of these these ballads, um, and I did look up a few that were very notable at that time, perhaps the most famous one was by Lee Young Foon, and this is Kwangamun Yonga, which is basically Kwangamun. I guess I guess is this like the anyway Kwangamun Yonga? <laughs> I don't know what the English title is, but uh, I pulled out some of the lyrics to kind of express to you like the the universal like the 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 what what is the word that you use like the group think or the group oh consensus like like the group conscious altogether thinking i don't know what that is yeah they're consensus together i guess it's like is it's that, like the shared emotion right okay the, sh- the vibe <laughs> yeah the <laughs> the vibe so <laughs> the shared emotion i guess of what was happening in the, the korean people's heart this is why many of the ballads are very sad but like this song is very representative of those ballads in the 80s and basically the lyrics go, now as we see time goes, things have changed without a trace. There are no traces left. And I walk this road that doesn't exist, but those, those memories still remain of walking with my lover. And so it's expressing how in Korea things change so quickly. And yet people remember, they carry this memory of a time before. Because Korea's history is very tumultuous and a lot of stuff happens to the music reflects that so there's no wonder that i mean this is the 80s even still so many people carry those memories and so these songs have a very special place in a lot of people's hearts you should listen to that song too okay well i'll continue with the 80s because this is very very significant we're about to hit something that changed everything and i have an interesting side story to tell you about this but uh so the 80s we know that we had the 1988 seoul olympic games this was big we start getting global attention this was really a huge breakout for korea to show the world look at us look how much we have moved forward we have gotten past those difficult times we've really advanced a lot as a as a country so this was a really proud moment for seoul uh for korea and they did show like this 80s electronic sound with like this song called seoul 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 that celebrated the olympics so this is where we're getting global attention but the biggest thing was korean mtv so MTV was, you know, popular in the States, right? But uh, MTV finally came to Korea. And remember how I mentioned K-pop is extremely visual. This is the first time people were actually connecting the visual with the music in a way, a streaming way that people could see it at not just, you know, a live concert, for example. And uh, so I actually met up with one of the main guys who got Korean MTV popular. He is one of the guys who actually launched, probably launched K-pop in Korea and then also over the seas. So he was here for this whole time period. So we actually got to interview him not too long ago. And I was keeping you guys in mind. And I was like, so what about in this case? And asking him all these questions, trying to get like off the record information. Crazy. It's so fascinating. Um. But uh, yeah, he was the one who really, he got picked up by some music executives here in Korea. And he was, they're like, oh, you like music? Whatever. He says, I love MTV. And they were like, no way. We just started launching Korean MTV. We would need someone like you because you know American music because he grew up primarily in the States. So this was like that bonding moment. So he really started to bring this uh, 
K-pop at the time wasn't called K-pop, but Korean acts onto MTV, and it was visually more interesting. Sorry, was he Korean American or he was like Korean American? Oh, okay, okay. Mm. Yeah, so it's pretty nuts wow. that this was happening, and uh, so we have MTV going. Did you, did you guys watch MTV? Is MTV still in the states? I watched like my super sweet sixteen yeah. on MTV a lot. I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, it's just reality yeah. TV show, I think. <laughs> yeah, it was like, what, 15 and Pregnant was like another one. Oh my 16 word. and Pregnant. Yeah, there's like not really music on really? it. Really? That much anymore. Yeah, maybe there is now. I haven't seen it in a while. But I remember there was a lot of reality TV shows. Mm. Like Made. I want to be made into like XYZ or whatever. Wow, I really don't know about any <laughs> of those. Like, I thought MTV was strictly just music. Yeah, I just remember their iconic David Bowie interview. Do you guys know that one? I think I think no. that was in the 80s. He basically addressed the host and he was like, you know, I don't understand why you're not playing any black artists during the day. And the host was like, oh, we just want to play music that, you know, try to keep it like with popular people, what they like. And he basically was just kind of, what do you call it? Tulyomai, like going around it. And David Bowie's eyes yeah. are like, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Iconic. But uh, MTV was very significant in music everywhere, apparently, states and in Korea. So here we have uh, the 80s and 90s. Korea is now breaking out of this kind of regime, undergoing democratization and liberalization. So as the country is becoming more free, so the people are also becoming more free. And the young generation, always starts with the young generation, they want a different kind of sound. They want a new kind of music. This is K-pop, now the 90s. 1992. Do you guys know Sateji and the Boys? Oh, is that a comeback no. home? <laughs> is that is that correct? Oh, I don't know if they did come back home. Oh, maybe oh, not. It's, it's possible. <laughs> I could be they wrong, did, though. His discography is is immense, so it could be one of them. Sateji wa either. Okay. Oh, this is great. So, <laughs> Sateji and the Boys. This was revolutionary. They are the birth of K-pop music as we know it today. So all of this history comes to this moment. We now reach this younger generation that's hungry for a new sound. And Soteji, that's his name, and the boys, his two guys, they debuted on an NBC talent show with this song called Nan Arayo, called I Know. Uh, maybe, do you guys know Nan Arayo? I don't think so. Oh, no. you gotta check this out too. It's, it's iconic. <laughs> so they debuted on this show. These, two, these three guys, young, they are, they're like, everything about them is street. They are totally mimicking or carrying this hip hop street look. And this was the first time this music, first time this look, first time rapping like this appeared in front of the Korean public. So they appeared on the show and they did the song Nan Arayo. And if you hear that like, like that backbeat, you know right away what song this is. They appeared. They had like the dancing. Before that, this kind of dancing never appeared. Before that, we didn't have this kind of rapping, the street look. They were the first. And uh, they appeared on the show. And I watched <laughs> I watched uh, the judges rating them afterwards. They got the lowest rating. All the judges were like, oh, you know, uh, I consider music as having words and a story that you understand. But didn't really understand this and then the other person was like oh it was new it was interesting your lyrics are very like soft but your dancing is really like clashing so that's too bad like none of them liked it nobody had anything good to say but what was important was the young generation just ate that up and they were so popular it just rocketed them to stardom and of course they then became that first concept of k-pop idol their look was hip hop. They were very vibrant, streetwear. They transformed the way that you thought because now media was so important, right? Everybody's consuming through media, MTV, these TV shows. And Sateji and the boys were just everywhere. They represented freedom. They represented youth. And their lyrics were speaking against the conservative and close-minded society. As you know, many of the young people really love that. So that was Sateji and the boys. That was huge, significant. Okay. I have a, was it a competition show they were on? I think it was a competition. Yeah, I think it was one of those music contests. 
everyone else was probably singing ballads then right and then it was just like <laughs> suddenly this hip-hop group yeah they came out of nowhere like it's so funny if you see them compared to who the judges are because the judges are just like this you know like these nice older korean people who were probably very famous singers in their time i guess um but nobody remembers them everyone remembers sateji and the boys they told it like they turned it upside down you guys gotta watch them they're so great very very okay good. after this i'll add it to my playlist <laughs> everything's going on tonight. yeah so here things start to speed up a bit 1995 this is when sm was founded as you guys know sm the entertainment company and then YG was also founded in, it was like 95, 96. And then 97, JYP was founded. So all of these entertainment industries popped up. One, two, three, the big ones. And it's because, you know, they had the foresight to see, oh, these guys are going to be big. And also YG was formed by one of the members of Sateji and the Boys. So they really oh, wow. led this musical revolution, I guess. Um, do you guys know H.O.T.? Have you heard of the group H.O.T.? Do they have a song called, like, Candy or something? Yeah, ah, Candy. I know that song. It's so, like, yes. it makes me, like, so energetic every time I listen to it. It's just very, like, joyful. Like, happy. Yeah. <laughs> very catchy. That was it. That was the song. That was the breakout with H.O.T. Yeah, they began properly this idol culture. It was in 1996. Wow, that's that's like an OG song. <laughs> I know that. This is like, yeah, this is legit. So H.O.T. broke out. Everybody wanted to be H.O.T. Everybody wanted to wear the clothes they wore. Everyone wanted their hairstyles. It was like the K-pop idol. This is finally, it was happening. And then, um, you know, Poa? Do you guys know Poa? I do, yeah. <laughs> you don't know <laughs> Nat. <laughs> I wow. taught you. I'm like so Jack, come on. <laughs> Jack, I thought I taught you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let me we gotta go back to that yeah, playlist. Gotta go just... back to the basics. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, Poa, she was also one of those early waves. I guess she's like later, maybe like early two thousands, but she was the one who first broke into uh the Jap- Japanese market. So she was kind of the the first Korean artist to go international. And this was big because the history also with Korea and Japan, as you know, is still not resolved. And so the, the Japanese market was very hostile to Korean acts. So when she broke into there, suddenly that changed that changed the game because J-pop and the Japanese music market was much bigger than Korea. So if you could make it big there, that was very, very significant because the music culture was very developed in Japan. So this kind of gave, it gave a little bit of credibility to what was happening in Korea. So Boa really started this new generation as well. And then the word K-pop was used for the first time in an article in 1999. Prior to that, it was called Kayo. Kayo is just, I guess, popular music is, I guess, what you could call it. But finally, it was called K-pop for the first time in 1999. And since then, of course, you know, everyone calling it K-pop. I'm curious, just before you go, sorry. Um, yeah, is so J-pop, was that... Like, were people already calling J-pop J-pop? Because, like, what is even J-pop? Like, how did, I don't, we don't have to go into, like, the history of J-pop. Yeah. But I don't hear any, like, Japanese songs. That's, yeah, that's a good question. I actually don't really know too much. I know rock and roll was really huge in Japan. And then, I don't know specifically about J-pop. I feel like it's been eclipsed by K-pop, to be honest, globally. But in Japan, I imagine it's probably still very popular all i know is that the musical scene in japan was it's very advanced actually so they have a lot of good uh musical underground uh indie music dives and i feel like it's it's pretty unique this is where they get a lot of great djs actually in japan and they just create new sounds so this is why like korean artists wanted to break into the japanese music scene but then we had this political you know difficulties so in a way k-pop is really like it's soft power, um, you know, using that term if we're talking on a political sphere, because hard power, what, like war and, you know, this diplomatic fighting stance. But K-pop is really a soft power. It's a way to show these other countries, hey, like we're not harming you or to break through these barriers that were there previously. This was a big case in Japan. So K-pop is not just music anymore. It is it's a cultural export as well. So it's really interesting to see this happen i think like also to oh uh, sorry to interrupt 
Uh, just to add on oh, to it, ahead. like just another aspect of that. Like I know since K-pop has become more mainstream mainstream in America, like the percentage mm-hmm. of American students in universities who are learning Korean like has increased significantly. And like once you start learning a language, that really changes everything you know so now like there are so many more americans who don't come from korean backgrounds but now they're learning korean so and and i think Mm. it's because of k-pop so absolutely totally k-pop put korea on the map (laughs) you know when i was growing up in the states i i remember so many conversations like it would always go they say oh where are you from and i'll be like i'm korean if that's what you're asking like no no are you japanese i was like no like you must be chinese like no like that was always how the conversation went and if it finally gets to korea they're like korea what's that where's that and then you if they know about korea the second question is are you from north korea or south korea so like this this amount of lack of knowledge about korea compared to in a 10-year span suddenly everybody knows so much about korea wanting to learn korean language is very mind-boggling to me honestly but that's the power of k-pop really gotta thank them for that at this point, like you see the first generation of K-pop, which we mentioned this would be like 1996. Um, and then 97, the Asia financial crisis was making singers try to expand their sound outside of the Korean market because the Korean market was so collapsing. So this is where they started getting, you know, Chinese singers or Japanese idols to join the groups as well. We had Rain, Super Junior, uh, Wonder Girls, Girls' Generation, Kara, Shiny, 21, FX. After school, I'm sure you guys have heard these names, right? Yeah, Super Junior's like... Yes, <laughs> yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, wait, so thing, are they... Choreography. Yeah, yeah, are they first generation or are they second generation? Then? They're more second gen. They oh, okay. They second gen, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, so I think first gen, we know first gen, what it looks like and what it feels like. H-O-T, maybe Fly to the Sky is also first gen speaking of fly to the sky i know the guy uh one of the singers we interviewed him as well for another thing and he's also korean american which was interesting oh wow um yeah you have becky you have all the connections i (laughs) like what how do you know all these people you're like were you a k-pop star like are you not telling us (laughs) first gen first gen yeah no actually i didn't know who he was when we met him like i was invited to interview him for this magazine shoot and then I went there and then I was like oh you know so tell me a little bit about you he's like well I'm this guy and I debuted with this group and I was like no no you didn't shut up that's crazy I had no idea he was first gen k-pop artist but yeah he's Korean American oh cool wow guy. Mm-hmm. look looks good for his age <laughs> <laughs> so uh okay second gen you know you guys know rain do you know p I he's like he's I've seen so many advertisements with him I didn't really know about him okay Nat go on well I just did I hadn't heard any of his songs but then now I'm like on the Mm -hmm. subway I see so many because he did the song with JYP recently and I've seen like the Mm -hmm. clips from the music video everywhere around Seoul so but other than that I Mm -hmm. don't really know I know that he's like I guess now I know that he's like uh, a much older second gen k-pop idol because i guess i didn't even think about that but yeah (laughs) yeah he was he was so big he was huge and actually check out if you look up rain stephen colbert dance battle he actually showed up on the colbert report he was that big yeah at a point it's very funny back in the day or recently back in the day I can't mm-hmm. imagine. This was like Stephen Colbert. Yeah, I was just about to say, I cannot picture that in my head. <laughs> it's pretty more sure that was performance, not a competition. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> no, no, no. You get like secondhand embarrassment. You're like, I want to take my eyes out, but it's really funny. And P looks great as always. I was in like 2006, maybe 2007, because the reason why he did that is Time Magazine had an online poll for. I guess he was like sexiest man alive or most influential man or something. And apparently Rain and Stephen Colbert were contesting against each other <laughs> and Rain beat him. Nice. Wow. And so Stephen Colbert was like, no, I got to show you. And so then they had the dance off, which is a little skit. But I mean, it's interesting to think Rain appeared in U.S. media. No one knows this. Well, you said sexiest man alive <laughs> and Stephen Colbert was on it. I'm so sorry. Like, I Maybe love Stephen Colbert. 
there's no way like I'm gonna put money down right now there's no way maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah it is weird to think that they were up against each other yeah. it's kind of hard to figure out what yeah category, category. Yeah. <laughs> right well because I, I think I've seen a picture of Rain and he's still very handsome he's and like Stephen gorgeous. Colbert is also handsome but like not like Rain yeah. handsome you know <laughs> very <laughs> different yeah See, yeah, that's why he had to do the dance battle to prove that he is just as sexy as Rain. And needless to say, it didn't work very well, but it's very funny. You should watch it. <laughs> okay. So yeah. many links. So we'll just put them all in the description. So many things. Yeah, you should just <laughs> title this episode, You Should Watch This. That's just what you're going to call it. Yeah. But, uh, okay, I'll just zip through the 2000s then. Okay, because this is kind of now... You guys are also catching up with this, and you'll probably recognize a lot of things that happened. In 2009, Wonder Girls were the first to debut on the Billboard Hot 100 singles, and they were so popular that when the Jonas Brothers did their world tour in 2009, they were an opening act. No. I know. The Jonas Brothers were in 2009? What? Yeah. Like, you would never think this. And I found this article that was talking about it, and they were like, five things you need to know about the Korean K-pop group that's debuting or, you know, performing with the Jonas Brothers. And they're like, they're so glittery. They're so adorable, which is very iconic of K-pop groups. They each have their image. And so, of course, the Wonder Girls have this, like, cute, sexy image. And then you'll have another group, like, 21, which is very experimental and, like, the cool girls. So every idol group, as we see, carries this kind of image. And especially during that time, they were developing their image. Now it's become more of uh, an individual thing. Like, you know who is the individual BTS members, and they have their own personality and their own fan, fan base. But prior to that, it was the, it was the group mentality. But this is Wonder Girls. 2009 and then uh boa was the first to appear in the billboard 200s and she was the last korean girl group i think to do that until blackpink very recently oh wow yeah so she was like way back she's ahead of the game that's so um, impressive because were the songs mostly in korean back then or did they have like bits of english as well yeah that's a good question so I actually asked that, that music executive about this because I was like, how did Korea, how did Korean music break into a primarily English speaking music industry? And uh, he said that, so when they upload songs on like uh, Spotify or iTunes or whatever, there you have to put certain genre. So you have to choose the genre. And the music executives who are in charge of iTunes said K-pop fell under the genre of world music, right? World music, as you know, nobody listens to world music. Like, who looks up world music on iTunes? Yeah. You, you just don't, to be honest. It's unfair, but it's true. So he was like, okay, if we put this song, which is a banger, under world music, no one's going to look it up. So he went around the system by instead putting the first genre as hip-hop or techno or folk, and then the second genre as world music. So whoever was looking up techno, that song could pop up on the list. And they started overtaking the English-based songs, and everyone was suddenly getting attention. Who are these guys beating out, you know, famous techno artists, famous hip-hop artists? Who are these guys? So the language didn't really matter. It was more about the sound and, of course, the visuals. And then everyone was getting their smartphone. And so the same music executive had the idea, we got to be able to translate these huge performances into the small screen. And so, again, got ahead of the game. And it just perpetuated everywhere so i skipped obviously a lot of groups like kata four minute shiny super junior there's just too many of them to bring up so shiny and super junior this is because they're part of the generation where it was the group that was more significant than the actual individuals so in bts you couldn't swap out a member then it wouldn't be bts anymore but in the case of shiny or super junior uh there have been members that have come and gone and also shiny has been around since like 2008 They've continually had comebacks. This is part of the marketing scheme in K-pop. You know, they they have like their section and then maybe they take a little hiatus or they have to go to military. Then they come back and they have their comeback, their comeback tour, which always generates a lot of interest. And Shiny has done really well because now their fans, when they do their comeback, their fans are older. And so they can spend more money or it's like the older... Uh, older women who like the young looking guys still or they remember like you are my first crush so shiny has done really well for themselves people love shiny oh okay so Gangnam style so getting to Gangnam style this was what 2012 right he was not only big because his song was awesome but also the youtube video it broke the internet literally it 
YouTube could not physically allow more than a billion views. And so because of his song, they had to expand the view limit. So he got just international attention because of that. And it's funny because in Korea at the time, Psy was like, he was fading out. People loved him. He had some hits. You know, Psy was like, hey, this is your last hurrah. You know, they're putting him on TV shows as a judge, for example. Like he wasn't, no one was expecting anything big from him. He drops this song and the whole industry here is turned upside down. Nobody saw this coming at all. And the reason is because Psy, he's so unique. He himself is the artist. He wasn't through this factory that a lot of the K-pop stars and groups go through now. He was just a one-off, hyper-creative, very interesting individual who happened to just have that one, one banger. And he just blew the doors wide open to K-pop. People love it. But it was interesting with uh, Oppa Gangnam Style because the reason also why it became popular was a mishearing. People heard the word Gangnam Style as condom style. And so it was kind of like people were like, what? What is this crazy song? What is this crazy song? So more and more like these kind of little incidents can lead to significant moments. So it's funny with Korean language. People are like, oh, we don't want to listen to it because it's not English. But in reality, it is thanks to Korean language that actually has led to some popularization. But I mean, we listen to Despacito without a second thought. Now Korean music is also becoming that way. A bop is a bop. Like if yeah. you like it, you like it. Yeah, yeah, it's so strange that that was kind of like his last hurrah because mm. for us, right, Gangnam Style was like, oh, who's this new fresh artist yeah. like from Korea? And then yeah. he had that second song. It was like... Gentleman? Yes, I, gen- I Oh, I love Gentleman. My daddy. Bah, bah, yeah, yeah, bah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like yeah. his second big bop. So I don't know. I always saw him like as very like new and fresh during that time. Yeah, I mean, Sai had been around for a while. He was already like mid 30s, I think, when that song came out. And it's very, you know, totally opposite of what the idol culture is like at that time or still to today. Like these very youthful people, sometimes 17, 18 years old, training for eight years to get that perfect group. And then Sai was just like, OK, whatever, I'm just going to do what I want. And then this opened the whole world's eyes to K-pop. So we have a lot to thank Sai for that one. So Sai, I mean, in a way, because he had been around for a while, he was doing really well. He was respected in the industry. This song, I think, was more of a culmination than necessarily his breaking out and just being a fortunate one-off chance. Um, He had the opportunity because he already had the experience and, you know, Korean support. People here loved him already. But if you're just a totally new artist, trying to break out like that is, I would say it's near impossible. And still this system that exists in K-pop training, it, it is still here today and uh, bts again why they are so just incredibly unique is because they're not from those three companies they're a totally different company that just opened up and they were the only group under that label so they're really quite a unique case and the reason they blew up in the states is because they actively chased after the international market they were popular in the u.s before they are popular in korea so because they made that active choice we're going to hit up the international market first which a lot of k-pop groups didn't do or couldn't do um and so i think a lot of these groups are chasing that now trying to break into the international market but it's not it's not so easy it's a combination of a bunch of different factors but the thing that's most unique about bts versus these other k-pop groups is they write their own music i think i think the audience can feel that sincerity that exists when the artist is creating their own music as opposed to factory systemic you know, uh, printing press idol groups. Yeah. So, yeah, because if you think about, like, Big Bang, why were they so big? They had G-Dragon. G-Dragon wrote their music. Mm. We, people can sense that, those individuals. Rain, same case. Boa, same case. So you can, you can kind of trace through the K-pop industry. Ah, these ones, yeah, they have big hits. Or these ones, we still love them today because they write their own music. We sense that real artist inside. So BTS is a very unique case. I don't know if there's going to be another... Thing like Psy. Um, yeah. Well, no, know. maybe one day. But also, maybe. well, Blackpink is very popular as well. But don't they not write their music? And I thought they were with like mm-hmm. a big company. Blackpink is with a big company. I don't know who they're with. Um, maybe they're SM, but I, you know, don't quote me on that. And I also don't know if they write their own stuff. 
I know they're trying to give them opportunities to be single artists. They try to do this, right? Make them a single artist to create their individual image. This is how K-pop now has evolved from the second gen, for example, or even third gen. Now it's about the individual and that's possible because people can live stream. They have their own Instagram handles, Twitter feeds, you know, like this is a way for the individual to connect with the fan base. So this is, I think, how K-pop is, has developed now past just that, that group image. Yeah. BTS is, I mean, they're kind of paving the way there. For sure. It's like a side story, but I didn't hear about BTS till I was studying in Korea. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things I saw, besides like hearing their music on the street, is an interview they did with Ellen. So I was like, wait, how are they in the States? And I'm watching like this. And one of my Korean friends was like, I don't know why BTS is so big. Mm -hmm. She's like, we have so many boy bands. So it's like, why BTS? So I was like, oh, are they not that big here? She's like, they're okay. Like people, like they're one of the top ones, but... Yeah, that's the thing. They were very smart. They because mm. they targeted the international market. Cuz other groups, they would try to make it big here by following the system and then they would expand out to the international market, but BTS even when they couldn't fill out 300 seat places, they would still go and perform in the US to whoever would listen, connect with their fans. They were one of the first to have a Twitter account and they would interact with people on Twitter. It was that individual thing that now exists thanks to social media and YouTube and all of this. And so BTS really capitalized on that. That's why they were really smart. So they got big in the States. Then in Korea, suddenly it was like, oh, well, they're so big because people in the States love them. But in reality, what was it that separated them, let's say audio wise from other boy groups? Nothing much, but we can see how they have developed. And uh, I think they were pretty smart to do that. They're a unicorn of the system, for sure. Yeah, and they're releasing English music. One of my friends is an army, and Mm -hmm. (laughs) she was saying, because I was like, I heard Butter, and it's all in English, and I didn't realize Dynamite was also in English. And I was like, there wasn't Korean in that. She was Mm -hmm. like, I think they're trying to win a Grammy. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. They're, like, specifically releasing things to win Grammys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll notice, too, like, the names of the groups, uh, BTS, even though originally it's Bangtan Sunyeondan, BTS is so easy and catchy in English. The names are very easy to remember in English. Every single song they release has an English title. And so K-pop groups are subconsciously, in a way, penetrating the English-speaking market by doing that, but still staying true to their Korean roots. By Most groups are not releasing whole songs in Korean, but I guess because BTS was heading for that Grammy, that would make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll notice yeah. that. That's so interesting. Wow. It's like all the inside questions I wanted to ask. But like never. Yeah, this is fun. I'm, I'm not a K-popper by any, like zero at all. But I love to read about the history and I really love music. So it's so fascinating to see like, oh, where are all these ties coming from? So this is, yeah, K-pop is very interesting because while it has, it's, it's become a superpower of its own. I feel like the really genuine artists like BTS remember the roots where this music all comes from. And this is why when they give performances where they're showing like the palace here, Gwangamun, for example, I think it was on, it must have been the New Year's, I think, where they're performing on a stage that was looked like the palace. Or maybe that was on Jimmy Fallon. I can't remember. But this was so significant for Korean viewers because it was like, wow, you're taking our history and you're showing it to this world power and people are loving that. So K-pop has evolved beyond just beyond just the money-making machine, which it is, we won't get into that. But uh, thanks to groups like BTS, for example, Korea is now able to show this side of them that the world hasn't seen before. For sure. I love that. That's really nice. I mean, like growing, okay, another side note, and I don't want to get us too off track, but I remember like growing up being half Chinese. I didn't know what Chinese was, but mm-hmm. like people, if you're half Asian or you're Asian, people assume you're Chinese in the States because it's such a big country. So I remember I was like, wow, Imagine if I was like Korean or Japanese and everyone's just calling me Chinese all the time. Like, at least I'm Chinese and it's like fitting. But it's so nice that like now we're becoming hopefully more globalized and everyone can like understand the diversity of Asia. And hopefully, like, more people who are from different areas of Asia don't have to carry that burden that mm-hmm. I think a lot of us felt growing up. Yeah, absolutely. Music has it has that power, it has that ability to do that, as we've seen historically everywhere in the world and so this is just this time period and i think korea is having its day to our listeners we'll link um the happy project in our description as well so you can check out that listen to all of 
the songs. If you've never heard of K-pop, then we'll link some K-pop songs as well. (laughs) Um, Yeah, thank you again, Becky, and thank you everyone for listening. We hope you guys learned so much, and we hope you guys have so many fun things to listen to and watch. And yeah, we will see you guys in the next episode. Bye. Bye!